Yes. Um, and so then, yeah, so I don't know if you, you didn't talk about just the two experiences that our oldest son had with primary. I don't know if you Go want ahead. to yeah. share those. Yeah, yeah. Do you actually, because one of them, you were with him. Um, and the other one, so one, he came home and so he is seven mm -hmm. years old. Um, You're six, right? Six. Okay. That's fine. And he said something within a uh, primary, something about um, the devil brings bad thoughts, the devil, uh, it, you have to be baptized. So it was prep for them to be baptized in primary school. Um, but he kind of had a meltdown and was terrified that the that Satan was taking over him and that he needed to be baptized then. And I was really shocked that that this little six-year-old was responding in that way. And I thought, this is not okay, that this little kid is experiencing this kind of terror. And this is 100% directly coming from primary. And a little kid should feel safe, mm -hmm. you know, and especially in religion, that is good news. <laughs> right. So that, that bothered me. And then the experience, the other one. That you were with him. Oh, the, there was a primary sharing time while we were in Boston where they... It was um, just junior primary. It was just junior primary, and it was supposed to be a lesson on the atonement, um, which, you know, you're dealing with junior primary, so most of the kids in that room don't even have, like, object permanence in their mind yet, right? <laughs> so to go to an abstract concept like the atonement was a pretty big stretch, but, they, but one of the things that they did is they invited this this little sunbeam dude who's four years old up to the front and they asked him to hold a weight above his head for as long as he could basically to show mm. <laughs> that he didn't have the strength to do it on his own. Right. Mm. But if you're a four year old boy in front of all mm. your friends and like all he wants to do is show that he's strong enough, he, he did everything he could to keep that weight up and eventually went like reeling back and crashing into the TV. And it was like, it was really, it was really upsetting to Brian. And he actually, I think that's the one where he turned to me and said, dad, can we leave? Wow. And I thought that was because. What a sensitive boy, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I do remember you saying that they, um, they needed to be quiet during the whole time. And if they did, the reward is that they would get to watch a movie, which ended up being the Lamb of God. <laughs> <laughs> to junior primary. Which I. Totally, I don't think appropriate for junior junior primary kids. Anyway, so that's when Brian asked to leave. You're right. Okay, so yep. they did end up showing it. Yeah, if they behaved, they could watch a movie, and the movie was that pretty graphic depiction of the crucifixion. And uh, yeah, and Brian, that's when Brian asked if we could leave. Mm, yeah. What a sensitive boy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I kind of got to where I thought, okay, I've taught uh, primary school before. I um, I start to think, oh, for my children, for them to be able to be getting their um, spiritual teachings, and I'm leaving it up to total strangers, and there really isn't training, and there is manuals, but it's also left up to, you can have the lesson kind of go towards the guiding of the spirit and things like that. So I became concerned that my that I was just handing my children's spirituality over to strangers which also involved their emotional health because of the way that my son was responding and also just with my own experiences uh, as a kid growing and up until now. Um, so those, all that, and then the mental health of my husband, I remember thinking, you know, some things have got to change. So I was trying to figure out what to do. I, um, as Ryan, as we start to learn some more things about the past of Mormonism. Um, Wait, what was that? Oh, uh, like, well, things that you, things that you were learning and reading. So at some point, so you're saying at some point Ryan started to, to read books and, and, and yes. read church history. Yeah. Did that make you nervous? What were you? No. Which so he I was, was he was first. Okay. <laughs> so you're having you're having these doubts, right? You're, and it's you're, you're, at these the same cracks time. are happening. Yes. You don't talk about it, but then you notice that Ryan is starting to read church history. Is that is that how it worked? The the experiences with my son 
and him starting to read things and his mental, it was kind of happening all at the same time. So what was it like for you? So, so Ryan, you were reading what kind of things you were starting to read? So this was after, so, um, very beginning. this was the Mormon very beginning. So, and... so I started listening to Mormon stories and they start, and then basically whatever authors you had on, I started chasing down. So I listened to the Todd Compton interview and then I went and got in sacred loneliness and then, um, Mormon enigma and, and I read, and you're the only one sacred that read loneliness. in sacred loneliness. Yeah. Cover yeah. To Cause cover. that was my, Okay, and so it's, I don't want to interrupt you. That was your what? That was your what? That, that was, you know, like I mentioned, polygamy was always at the top of my list. I could not. Mm -hmm. That just was never jiving for me. And I thought, I want to put this to rest. I think it is a crap show. <laughs> oh. So I, I had always felt that polygamy, way. Polygamy, polygamy. Yeah, something's wrong with this. Mm -hmm. So I did read Sacred Loneliness, and I went, cool, nail that. Coffin. That was the nail in the coffin for that, that you issue think what? permanently. That that was hundred percent wrong. Mm. It wasn't okay that that happened. Um, parts still are probably true though. Right. Um, anyway, uh, so as far as when Ryan started reading, and he would share everything with me, so we actually were talking and very open about parts of our doubts, and uh, at that point. Because 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 nor normally this part of the story, if it's a stereotypical story, it's and it's not always the true. Other. Yeah, like like the it's often the man that starts stumbles on CES mm -hmm. letter or Mormon stories podcast or some book or yeah. the, something on the internet starts having a faith crisis, and then the wife freaks out because she's like, "This is not what I married, and how dare yeah. you?" And now I'm terrified. And what I'm hearing you say is that wasn't your reaction. True. What yeah. was your reaction? It was, I realized I was quietly excited. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I, well, and it was, I didn't realize, you know, till the time that that was happening that I thought, oh my gosh, I think I've got like a metaphorical suitcase that's packed. I'm ready to go anytime. You were, yeah. You were and ready. I, yeah. But yeah. That I did not realize that. And you didn't realize it. No. And I was, was there a moment where you're like, oh my gosh. I, it kind of, it, it did freak me out a little bit, you know, and that I was surprised that, wow, have I, <laughs> have I been done for a long time? I, uh, because I was in a place that I felt safe and I knew my marriage would be okay and my kids would be, would be okay if I allowed myself to go, you know what, I'm actually not okay with this and I'm fine if we're, if we leave and I want to leave. Great. This is great timing. I can now allow myself to ask those questions. Oh my gosh. I'm having a thought, Ryan and, and Holly, you know, we talked about Ryan, your inner voice from a young age, shouting out to you that, that something wasn't right. And you kind of packing it down. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you had that going on too, Holly, mm -hmm. that you, you had your conscious self, which was like, I'm all in the church is true. This is the one true church and I'm in. But you had this parallel process going on in your own brain simultaneously mm -hmm. where you were kind of losing faith, putting things on the shelf, and things were eroding. Right. But you weren't really conscious of it. It was happening. It was in the back burner. But that was constantly progressing to the point where when your conscious self was ready to uh, consider leaving, you were there already. Right. The, the, the parallel process was yeah. already fully baked and it was just like, yeah, that it, that it, so both of you had this parallel process going on mm -hmm. inside of you. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the little elements too, of why I didn't feel like I was, I wasn't in a safe place to think that and ask those questions up until that point without him is because when I got married, I went, I am now totally dependent on another adult and yeah. that that is that's where feminism that comes back terrifying yeah. to me as yeah. a as a capable adult that could have taken care of myself and my in, de, in my dependence so me trying to take care of my dependence meant i had to completely rely on ryan and then since he was okay to leave it made me go oh my gosh i'm ready to go Ready to go right now. Let's <laughs> let's get in the car and head out. <laughs> anyway, then my kids were safe and I, you know, safe and and I I'm loyal and faith, you know, 
he's my partner for life and forever. So I thought back, well, what if I would have gone, gotten to the point where I questioned and decided I didn't want Mormonism? What, what would I do? And I still don't really know. But parts of me kind of thought, well, I guess, you know, like other uh, families and stuff, I would have, tr- uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done, but I would have stuck with you and just hoped that you would have, I don't know. There actually were points, well, we'll probably get to it, but when we did go back to Rexburg, anyway, yeah. Okay, we'll kind get back. Kind of jumping ahead, but. Okay, so you guys now are, are both an active questioning of the church. You're living in the Boston area. I'm still totally active. Yes. You're still totally active. Cause, cause, but you're both totally questioning the church. Yes. Right? I do remember that there is one point where I went, I don't want my kids to go to church anymore. And I, you know, we did talk to Ryan and Ryan and I talked about this and I thought, okay, I'll do home primary with them. Was that I before thought, you had stopped going? I, I had stopped going. Okay, so we didn't talk about that. Months. So how was that conversation like you're going from having doubts simultaneously? Was there before or after? I mean, okay, so there's both of you having doubts and questioning. At some point, there's going to be a decision that I no longer believe the church is true on either one or both of your parts. And then there's also a decision for you, Holly, to stop going. How was the chronology? W- which happened first? Well, or is it all no, kind of uh, happening at one time? Uh, it's, so in my mind, it was just all exploding at the same, at time. The same yeah. time. So you're just like, I'm out. So so when Holly says, I don't want to go to church anymore, what was that like for you, Ryan? Um, well, oftentimes for the one who's still in church, that's pretty I under- traumatic. So because we had gone through, again, for me, it was like, in retrospect, now it was deconstructing literalism. But that just for me, but... You were becoming a progressive Mormon. Yes. Very much so. Yeah. Um, and even though there was a part of me that was done with it, there was another, this is where the black and white thinking just doesn't work. And I know this frustrates some of my post Mormon friends and some of my active <laughs> believing friends, because at the same time that I had, you know, when I said goodbye to God, I meant it. Like I thought that was the end of my faith period at the same time, I really, really wanted to find a way to stay in. And so, um, and that's just, I know that doesn't make rational sense, but I did it. I'm definitely not making the argument. <laughs> I did it that for 13 rational. years. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah so <laughs> I get it. A lot of people get it. Uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, something we're not bringing in enough is that you were freaking on contract to BYU Idaho. Yes. Like they say that it's impossible to get a man to see a point of view when his livelihood depends on not seeing it. You were, this was your, your career. This was your love. It was my love. And there's a lot of good in the church if you want to see it that way. So there's just a lot of binding forces that would make it so, of course, you don't leave. I mean, the church right now is full of people that don't believe it. Some or all of it. But for business or for family or for social pressures or for marriage or because they don't know how else to raise the kids or for their own Mm -hmm. psychological reasons, they, they stick with it. Yeah. Right? Sure. And so that's where you were, right? That's where I was. So I don't, I mean, I remember being nervous. Like I remember watching Holly walk towards being completely done. And even though I totally empathized and supported her, it still scared me. What were you scared of? Um, Oftentimes it's the, the infidelity or divorce might happen. I, sometimes it's career. Sometimes it's the children. Well, and also we were told... You know, if people leave, this is how they will be. The condition fear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I that's think. You'll I be think dark. And that, that's right? what was largely, and even now, I mean, I still have those fears come up like in my body, you know, like that was very effective conditioning, I'll <laughs> say, because I, I still, I still feel those fears from time to time. And in fact, I had to write them all down in one sentence. And that was just a few weeks ago to help myself realize that. I didn't need to be afraid of those anymore. Of which ones? Just, just all of right. If you leave, then it's not going to be long before you're a, 
um, you know, drug addicted prostitute, pros- yeah, you know, like <laughs> who's, who's widowed and has cancer and your children have died tragically. And, you know, I mean, there's so many stories, um, that I heard growing up that that fear felt very real to me. Okay. Yeah. 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 There was, yeah. Whole big mixture of stuff going on at the same time. But you weren't as worried. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what, what was happening with you? <laughs> I felt relief. Um, there was a mixture of feelings. I felt relieved, scared out of my brains. Um, also, the even when I was a true believing Mormon, I was terrified of the people I loved dying. So that was always massive. But then with no longer having the golden ticket of being a Mormon, so I would be protected and my children would be protected. That, <laughs> with that ripped out, I um, was way more panicky of, and I know this is normal, uh, of my children or husband dying or me dying and not being able to be there for them. So there was a mixture of fear and relief and actual final peace and excitement of, I can now decide how I think about all issues in my life. And I get to make decisions for me. Oh my gosh, how wonderful. Um, I do remember though, there was a point where I also, besides doing just primary at home, this was a little bit past that. Um, where I remember thinking, I, when I thought, okay, this, I don't think this is a healthy place. It's not a healthy place for me. I don't think it's a healthy place for my children. I don't think it's a healthy place for my husband, um, because of what he's dealing with and his suicidality. So you started to tie his suicidality to the church. I did. And, you know, How, what was the connection in your mind of, uh, that, uh, just, just of the way teachings that were broken, that we come broken and that only Christ can heal us. And, um, he mentioned a few of the things and those were some things that he did share with me. You, and those- you shared those, you, you were feeling like the church was, a. Uh, a big part of his depression and suicidality. Yes. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember getting to the point that I thought super mama bear, hell no. Are they going to hurt my children? I'm drawing a line. They will not cross. If they do, I will take them out. I'll fight to the death. No way. I survived. I don't want my kids to have to go through that. Cause what if they don't survive? What if my husband doesn't survive? He's going to die because of this dysfunction that's happening. No, <laughs> nope, no way. Anyway. So, and part of, I have to say this part of what's interesting is that he's the one that's suicidal. Right. And he's wanting to stay in the church. And then you're just the observer and you're wanting to get out of the church because you're attributing his suicidality to the church. But mm-hmm. as he's experiencing the suicidality, he wants to stay. It's almost, I don't want to offend anybody, but what it reminds me of is like, a an abusive spouse, a spouse of an an abusive spouse that's kind of tied to something that's hurting them. Mm -hmm. But as an observer, you're saying it's abusing you get get away, but they don't see it. And I, I'm not saying that that's how I'm defining the church, but this, this is sort of what, what your situation is reminding of. You're sort of saying, get out of this. It's hurting you. And he's saying, no, I want to stick in it. Is that a stretch? No, Actually, I've, I've referred to this recently, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, well, you are going through a huge divorce right now, right? <laughs> You're divorcing the church. So this is, you know, massive. That's massive. Anyway, so yeah, this is kind of interesting. I, yeah, we did sort of frame it that way a little bit. Um, yeah, in our own conversations, we've yeah. talked about the parallels between those things. So Yeah, yeah, because there are good things just like within some marriages with dysfunctional relationship, the person who could be the abuser also has some real genuine, actual goodness. Always, them, pretty much always. This is why it makes it really yeah. difficult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Anyway. Um, so you're getting excited. Yeah. You're getting excited, yeah. but scared. Yeah. I'm terrified, but excited. Yes. And also knowing we're going to be moving back to Rexburg. 
forever. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And I thought, well, I'm fine because I'm an adult. I can handle it. We've got little kids. Oh my heck. And it's, it's 89%, 98% LDS. And we're going to raise kids there. What in the hell are we doing? <laughs> what are we going to do? Anyway, so. And that's also, that's also a really interesting conundrum because so many people stay in the church for their kids. But then there's this point in a faith crisis where you flip. And instead of staying in the church for your kids, you want to leave the church for your kids. And that's, that's a bit of a flip, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And that's how you were feeling. You're like, get these kids out of here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> and then for how was my, that conversation uh, with Ryan and yeah, I? Yeah. Yeah. How did we, it's like tiny little snippets. It was, what was your interpretation. I mean, my, it was similar. It was like, I, so I no longer felt the urgency to have them baptized because my literalism had crumbled, but, and I, and Holly was like, absolutely. <laughs> We are not, they are not getting baptized. She was adamant about that. And um, so I, I just kind of ended up deferring to that. It was like, if that's where she is and she, she was very, very much there, then that's what we'll do. Then they, then we won't have them be baptized. That's my, is that? Yeah. Yeah, I think or so. Or do you remember something? No, no, that sounds right. This is right. all very fuzzy to me right. at this point. Yeah, so. and um, and for us to be going back to Rexburg, where we were both from, where Ryan's job was and our livelihood was, and it was also, it was really heartbreaking too because that was his dream job and he had his dream job and it was really great job um, financially and he was, you know, teaching and in music, what he, what he does. And he's great at it. Um, so really there was just a whole bunch of unanswered. I don't know what we're going to do. Oh. We had to, yeah. <laughs> to face yeah. going back there. So anything else worth mentioning about um, Cambridge before we, we move to move into Rexburg? I have hmm. two kind of yeah. um, important things to me. One was that near the end I had this, there are these important trees to me through my story. And one of them was this, um, I used to jog from, from Needham to Newton, uh, on a daily basis as I was going through, whereas we were coming to the end of Boston. That was my Mormon stories time was out, <laughs> was out jogging. And, um, and so I would jog across this bridge across the Charles river every day. And, um, one, t at one point while I was jogging, I came across this, I noticed that there was a tree on the bank of the river and that the, and that the, there was a branch at the base of the tree that had snapped and was kind of being tugged at by the water, um, while it was still holding on to the tree. Right. Mm. And, mm. <laughs> and I, and that became almost a, it really was kind of a personal ritual for me to go jogging over the bridge and to look. Um, and I was always rooting for that branch, like <laughs> to see if it would finally be able to let go of the tree. Um, and I remember playing out scenarios in my mind. Well, if it lets go of the tree, it's going to die. And then I would play out others. And I was like, no, it's not going to die. It's going to eventually find its way to the ocean and become part of the cycle <laughs> of life, you know, and it became this whole, for me, it became a really important metaphor. And, and I had this realization at the time, like, because our last day in Needham, I went for a jog, I went and was like, okay, this is the day it's going to have let go. And I came and jogged across the bridge and it was still there, still holding on to the tree. And, uh, I just remember just feeling very clearly some day it's gonna, I don't know when <laughs> someday it's going to find the strength to let go of the tree. And, uh, so that was really important to me. And the other really important thing to me in Boston was, um, that I stumbled across a uh, Newell Bringhurst mm -hmm. yeah. research. Uh, on Fawn Brody or something um, else? On Elijah Black, Abel. Oh, on Blacks and the Yeah, the Neither Black Nor White book. Um, and when I learned the story of Elijah Abel, it just captivated 
me completely so much so that I ended up my doctoral project was that I composed a nine movement suite based on his life. Um, in trumpet uh, for jazz quintet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And we're actually hoping to record that later this year. Um, finally, but, um, anyways, what did that mean to you? The Elijah Abel story? It was huge to me because I didn't know any of the details around his life. And when he, and the, and, and for me, and this, I recognize this is fictional cause we don't have the records, but the thought to me was he made the trek across the plains, right? Um, expecting with his wife and children, um, hoping to be embraced as a, as a, as a fellow citizen with the saints, as he was when Joseph was leading the church and he, but he came over when he arrived in the Salt Lake Valley. It was right after Brigham Young had basically instituted the temple band and the, and the priesthood band. And, um, and just thinking to myself, how, what would that have been like for him? It was very autobiographical for me to just the disillusionment of that. And, but then he chose to stay. He stayed for his entire life. And the last thing he did was serve a mission for the church. And um, if I'm remembering all the details right, so there was something about that model of staying that felt really important to me at the time, I think, and um, but also allowed me a vehicle to explore feelings I wasn't even letting myself realize I was having, mm -hmm. that I could think about them in relation to his story and Holly's told me since then it was super obvious to her that what I was composing was autobiographical, but truly at the time I was not allowing myself to see that. <laughs> so again, the parallel processing. Yeah. It, we're continuing that theme. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, yeah. so those were two important pieces kind of wrapping up the Boston years for okay. me. Yeah. Trees as a constant metaphor in your life. They keep coming back. <laughs> yep. Really quickly, in a, at this point, you're kind of in a bit of a mixed faith marriage, even though you're becoming more nuanced and, and liberal, Ryan. But Holly, you're like, you're done. Mm -hmm. um, it's normally common in mixed faith marriage for the less believing partner to try and get the more believing partner out, to get them to stop believing, to get them to stop going to church, and to be super angry and kind of like even annoying about trying to dislodge them so that you're kind of on the same page. Did you, did any of that go on or not really? Holly was yeah. incredibly supportive of me and has always been just, she would always say things like, I want you to have your journey, your, your Mormonism, whatever that's going to be. I want you to have that. And I'm, and I'm here while you do. And what, what, how were you able to do that or why? Was that because you knew BYU-Idaho was there and, and there was no out? Or was it just that's who you are to let someone else have their process? Right. I think, you know, it's a little mixture as however things were adjusting as they went along. Um, as far as like, well, it was we could be here for the rest of our entire lives in Rexburg, BYU-Idaho, or possibly another job. Who knows? Could come along and we could take that. But since it was Ryan's dream job, it pretty much when we were in Rexburg, it did feel like that's where we we're going to be. Um, as far as like him being able to be his own Mormon and have his own religion, there's a handful of things. One, because he was supportive of me not wanting our kids to be Mormon. That was huge. Um, you felt less panicky because yes. your kids were going to be yes. out. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and then also the way he um, gave me space and respected my feelings and beliefs made me not worried about our kids. Um, and then also me to be able to have my own space. I mean, I, I wanted to return that to him to be able to uh, respect his space and because it was very important to me that whatever his spirituality was and his relationship was, that he could feel safe and that it could be genuine and it could, it had time and could develop, grow, however it was going to be. There always was a tiny little in the back of my mind of what if he changed and became like super orthodox and kind of like, you know, unhealthy orthodox, what would I do? 
And I, you know, well, I'll make, I'll figure out some way to make it work, you know, and I really hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> so I never mentioned that to you. No, I've missed, that's my first time hearing that. <laughs> that we shared it with all of you as well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay. So we're off to, we're off to Rexburg. Is that the next? Yes. So the next my family being super uh, devoted, uh, devout, um, our oldest was nearing his eighth birthday and we we're going to be coming back to Rexburg. So I spilled the beans and sent them all a big, massive, I'm leaving letter. What? Yeah. Yeah, that's a big deal. <laughs> so you did write the letter. I did to my family. Yeah. And that was, you know, horrible. <laughs> Horrible, horrible for to everybody. write or horrible for them to receive? Horrible for them to receive. Were you um, worried about being cut off? Or, or are you the only, you're the oldest, so. One of the oldest, yeah. One of the so oldest. Oldest daughter. Okay, yes, oldest daughter. daughter. Yeah. Were you the first of your siblings to leave? Yes, and only sibling, still. To, to this day. Yes, yeah. So that's super hard. Yeah, super hard for everybody. Super yeah. hard for me, super hard for all of them. A lot of people just decide to stay in the closet just to avoid that conflict. What right. made you feel like you had to write the letter versus just kind of in your mind drift away and just fake it right. or, or just keep it private? Two, th two things. My son was going to turn eight and then actually my youngest brother was getting married. Um, and, and some people just lie and get their temple recommend. I and I toyed with that <laughs> back and forth. Um, my recommend, so they were going to, they were going to get married. I can't remember a particular date and my recommend would, would have still been current through that month. And I thought, okay, <laughs> I can, I can stuff it in and be totally fine. Cause this is, you know, I'll 100% support my brother and this is super special to him and I can still go make it work. Um, but then they changed the dates, and so it ended up being passed. So I would have had to have gotten and getting it renewed, and I it just like made me physically ill. The thought of, you know, having to do that and, and lying as far as like I didn't feel bad lying to them, but just for me, and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't. That just it feels so yucky <laughs> for me to do that, and so that was actually extremely difficult. For me to go to my, and he was, you know, since I was one of the caretakers, he was kind of my little baby sort of. Uh, so for me to go to his wedding and have everyone, excuse me, uh, walk into the temple and I stayed by myself. Um, that, yeah, that was difficult. But I, anyway, I, I just couldn't lie and get in there. Cause, and then mm. it was... It was just bad timing. So I needed to tell, I wanted to tell my family. And it was like probably five, four months before we moved back to Rexburg. So that hopefully enough dust would settle. settle. And anyway, so it was, it was the timing of my son's birthday and then my younger brother's wedding. And how, what are you able to say about how your family received the news and um, how they did or didn't treat you? Looking back, I wish I could have written the letter in a different way. Did you like list all the truth claims problems? I, and yeah, I did. You enumerated those. them yeah, all. Yeah, you know, and I was raw and yeah. So I wish I could have written in a different way. I think it would have just softened it a little. I think this, the actual uh, outcome would have been the same, but I that's a regret. I wish I could have, uh, could go back and fix that. Um, yeah, it, they didn't cut me off. Like happens with some faiths and families. Um, but it was permanently changed and is still, and I knew that that would happen. Um, but it was worth it to me, even though it's so difficult. Uh, cause kind of overnight I, my street cred was gone. Um, and, you know, my opinion was always and mostly still is question always like or my interpretation of how my opinion on anything pretty much is being received by all of my family member, family members. So you kind of become a second class citizen in the family. Yeah. And, and generally... Right. They lose respect. 
Yes. Yeah. 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 Overall, globally, not just in church matters, but just kind of every, yes. all matters. <laughs> yeah, which parts of that, I was kind of surprised how broad that became. Yeah, so, mm. anyway. Really quick, up. Ryan, did you go Did you go to the temple or, or while she stayed out, or did you both stay out of the temple? At, you went some. No, I mean, right? it, when she had, for that wedding. For, oh, no. I actually wasn't there for that. Yeah, because I still was in, so it was like the month, month when we moved back. So it was right before we moved back. So I flew out. There's an earthquake. All right. <laughs> Hopefully it's just a tremor. <laughs> wow. We just experienced an earthquake. I don't know if you could notice that um, on camera, but we just <laughs> had our second or third earthquake of the day. So Awesome. We'll know which door frame to run into. <laughs> Internet's still running. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. So it was my little brother. Bro yeah. So I flew out. To, okay. You, to you California, flew out. But it wasn't like he went but in. I was and, still in Massachusetts. Yeah. And part of why I'm asking is because also, it, it when one stays in and the other leaves, that that introduces an interesting dynamic in the family because then, you know, some people might be blamed and others, you know, that might right. not be. And which is interesting. And, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Well, um, he got blamed. For me leaving. Even though he stayed in. Yes. Even though he's the one that was, stayed in. How did morning. that happen? <laughs> I'm not sure. And it bothers me. And it wasn't just, it was, it was my family and family members and friends. And it, it, that made me, still makes me angry because the way I received it was you, Holly, can't uh, stand on your own. Stand on your own. Can't make your you own can't decisions. Make your own decisions. That's not a good thing to uh, communicate to a feminist. <laughs> no, no, no. It's still, yeah, yeah, still. Bugs, and he so. wasn't leading. He wasn't leading. I mean, he was questioning and he was doubting. Right. But he was very much wanting to stay in. Right. And he needed to scramble and form his own relationship, which he was doing. And this was your processing, and so then they, and you felt the family was kind of attributing that to him. Because they yeah. don't want to, I would just guess that they wouldn't want to think that a daughter that they raised could ever sure. arrive at that decision on their own. Yeah, for so sure. They've got, so I would think that they would got to find, they would have to find someone to blame who's the biggest influence on you. It's your husband. But I still yeah. don't get it. If he's staying in, what made them want to blame him if he was still staying in? Did they know he was questioning too? Well, there had there. No, I don't know. I don't so know. I had one. The, uh, the only evidence I have for what led to that is that I had one interaction with Holly's mom, where she flew out to Boston to visit us, and she um, and told me she sat down with me and told me that um, she the reason that she had flown out was to to tell me like she felt like God wanted her to tell me that my liberal thinking was was negatively affecting Holly mm. um, because I had started reading books by like Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist. Monk, oh, that's super dangerous. And, yeah. Yeah. All about <laughs> mindfulness and compassion. And, but one of the things, but that was the, that became sort of my grounding for my own developing tolerance because Thich Nhat Hanh in those opening in the opening pages of his book, Living Buddha, Living Christ, which is incredible, mm -hmm. he says um, he was at an interfaith conference and, 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 a, and a leader of another faith got up and said, you know, we're here to taste other fruit, but we're not here to make fruit salad. This, you know, at this interfaith conference and then Thich Nhat Hanh, it was his turn to get up and speak and he got up and said, Fruit salad can be delicious. <laughs> so, I um, love that guy. He's I like Dalai Lama. He's like yeah, Eckhart so, Tolle. He's one of the... Yeah. So for me, that became... I think that I remember them being uncomfortable with me reading those things. Um, so mom, her mom, mother-in-law flies out to tell you stop, she felt stop reading these non-correlated... You know, non Deseret book, non general authority approved. She was materials. worried. She was scared. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and possibly a thing that I think uh gave space for that, for them thinking that way is kind of throughout my life when there was things I, I didn't say things as much because there was no one I could talk to. You know, so as far as like some of those shelf things I mentioned, I didn't talk to my parents about most most all of those. Um 
So as far as like them getting any wind of, I'm not okay with this and it's not healthy for me, you know, they didn't get a whole lot of that. But still, regardless, you shouldn't <laughs> think that someone's dis decisions that they're not capable of making their own mm -hmm. decisions. So that was still hurtful and mm -hmm. frustrating. Mm -hmm. And we suspected that that was what was going on. And we just a f few months ago, a couple of Holly's cousins came over to the house to kind of share their faith journeys with us. And I'm and, not alone. And they, and they confirmed that that's what had, they actually brought it up that, that when Holly left, that the, most of the talk going on in the extended family was that, that somehow that was me and my family actually mm. that, that had been, and that was, <laughs> when they said that, I <laughs> said, I knew it. Anyways, I, yeah. um, that's still that's hard for me. That's still hard. What's hard so, about that for you? Um, I guess my, uh, I, it's, it, it frustrates me and maybe they don't see Holly this way anymore. And, and, but it really is frustrating to think that they, would see her as someone who just follows the whoever she's around because my experience in our marriage as it regards faith is quite the opposite. I mean, I feel like she has led and I have slowly come to realize that, you know, like I wrote a huge essay about all of this and I titled it Holly and Eve because I feel like she's like our life is playing out like in that archetype Eve she, she, she ate the fruit. <laughs> she saw it had to happen as, she a, good saw thing. The, as a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Like she, yes, as the, as, a, a, as like, this has to happen for, for us to thrive and as and, an act of courage and, and as an act, an act of love of, of truth, right? Courage, love of truth. And I cannot fathom the solitude or the, or the suffering that she must have gone through to lead like that. Um, so, yeah, I've kind of a reclaiming of that narrative. So, so you felt like but, she deserved, you kind of felt like she deserved courage. She re deserved respect and honor. And then, absolutely. and then to see it juxtaposed with not only them not honoring her, but them just not even viewing it as her own decision that, that made it doubly that, hard. That, were, that made it doubly hard. Yeah. And like I said, maybe that has shifted. It may well have. And, but we don't talk about but we don't talk things. about these things. <laughs> Mormon yeah, families. Right. We just avoid. We completely so. avoid ever talking about <laughs> anything super important. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. That way. Okay. Yeah. So you moved. Uh, you moved to Rexburg. You don't baptize your child. Your your child. Right. You don't go to the wedding, and now you're in Rexburg, where you've you've got your old job back. Mm -hmm. You're now on track for tenure. Cause you got your master's yeah. Finish the doctorate. So finish your doctorate. Yeah, mm -hmm. And then you're living a, as a mixed faith couple in the belly of the beast in Mormon, Saudi Arabia in <laughs> yeah. Mormon downtown room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how does that go? Oh, yeah, it was hard. What's that like? Hard, difficult, like day to day difficult. What's it like? Let's just back up. What's it like living as a married couple in Rexburg? Like we never really like, is it, is it just like Utah County is it just like Salt Lake? Is it just like it seems Massachusetts more, or is it like a whole different level? It seems more concentrated in my observation. More, more, more Mormon. Yes. Um, for example, the big grocery store there, one of the screensavers are different photos of temples, which, you know, is in interesting. The grocery store, in yeah. The grocery so store. for me to like not <laughs> have anxiety attacks every day, every time, if I was there, I think, okay. Let's pretend I'm living in New York City and I'm going to a Jewish deli. <laughs> sure, of course they can have parts of their religion that are there. Great, because this is privately owned grocery store. Um, but it it was tough. <laughs> what else about Rexburg I, that's unique or different? Either of you jump okay, in. Okay, I think I well yeah, and jump in when you, you want. Um, I mean, the fact that I it's, that it's, it's a university town right? that's Mormon owned and the whole town is built around the university and the temple, I'm guessing. Right. And it being 98% Mormon, um, that means that your 
accountant's Mormon, your grade school teacher's Mormon, your next door neighbors are Mormon, everyone's Mormon. Your ward so, is like two streets probably. Yes, yeah. yeah. So church and state is just intermixed all the time. And it being a totalitarian type of faith, everything <laughs> is Mormon and it's in the air all the time. Um, and they're, they're, I would phrase it, I would call it air suckers, <laughs> that sometimes I'd be somewhere and just sitting there at the doctor's office and everyone talking about the religious just sitting next to you. It's just, I just felt like everyone's sucking the air. I don't even have air to breathe, but I can sit here and be in my own little space to breathe my own air. And it, people weren't doing it intentionally, but that's just how it was. So I, you just can't escape. Is it because you just feel like you can't escape it? Like, right? Yeah. You're at the dentist office. You're at elementary school PTA. Yes. And everybody's talking about their callings in the temple and the latest Mormon news. Yeah. And, and you're even, like, how do I the freak get away from this? Yes. And even like my children's school teachers assumed that I was Mormon, and they would, you know, drop little comments and things like that. And I, you know, just like, wow. <laughs> Not even when we're having parent teacher conference is their church and state separated. Um, and I did end up finding a little, uh, group of women and there was a so post-Mormon group that was in Rexburg and that Shout was- Shout out to Don Anderson. Yes. <laughs> hey Don. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yep. And, uh, that was so helpful because I could go How'd you find them? I- This is oh, a yeah. funny story actually. Yeah. Because one of the it's members funny. of the group- like yeah, listen, Diana, good, good. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Diana? She, uh, um, she's now in Arizona. So, um, but she, um, she, she found me. You're, I was you're teaching. I'm teaching at BYU Idaho, and she found me right before I was going in to teach a class. And she, are you Holly Nielsen's husband? And it's like, how would she have heard of Holly? Wait, what was it? Your she, guess is as good as mine. That's what was so fascinating about this, right? Because the town. You know what? Was it through Don? Well. You know, it might have been through Don, um, that they found out there's a new family that came back. The wife left, you know, and I, I went through the papers. I signed my name. I was officially you resigned. completely resigned. You resigned from the church. Yeah, completely. But it's weird that in a town, number one, someone would find out that you weren't, that you weren't a member. Mm -hmm. And that then that they would all talk about it. And then yeah. that they would like be so concerned about who it was. And then you have to go hunt down and find like these people weren't in your ward, right? No, like no. how in the world would they have known that there, you were a part member family? Yeah. I, well, let's see. I yeah. 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 And I think <laughs> so. Diana who did talk to you was kind of going through the same thing herself, faith, faith crisis and transition. Her husband also teaches somewhere else and had at BYU Idaho. So yeah, I can't remember now. She told me how she heard the wind of it, but then tracked down Ryan. But Basically, still. if someone hears that there's some couple yeah. in Rexburg yeah. where oh, there's someone, one of, yeah. one of the two is not a, a member. Right. And it's like, I got to find out who the couple is, you know, where's the, you know, and how do I find them? Because like, this is, it, it must have been super rare that these people were just like, oh my gosh, there might be one other person like me. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. Which was awesome to find someone else <laughs> yeah. like me. Yeah, because so, they're desperate, right? Yes, yeah. You feel so alone. And, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so, she, yeah, so she introduced me to the group and I went and I would go the whole the five years, however long were we there still? Seven. Seven years. So I went. So what did the group, what was the group like? What did it do? Um, we framed it as a book group, so we did have intentions of reading a book <laughs> together. And so, so, you can tell, so you wouldn't have to tell people it was yeah. an anti so armor group or an ex yeah. group. Yeah, it's so, just a book group. Yeah, so every once in a while we would read. You know, some people would read the book. Sometimes we would talk about the, a book, um, but it was a whole mixture. And there was, and it, we mostly there was a bigger extended group, but it was pretty much just kind of was were women within the Rexburg uh, Rigby area. Um, and there were a lot of women who were mixed marriage, faith, um, and some that were had public jobs. So they were all the vast majority were not were not out in public about it because they were afraid for their jobs and uh, their marriages, some of them and things like that. So I I felt fortunate that I wasn't in their position, and but I super felt horrible for them that they were uh, experiencing that. 
And would you, so you guys would meet how often? Uh, I think it was one, once a month. Once a month? Yeah. And what types yeah. of things would you do? Just um, where, it, where would you meet and what would you we do? We kind of rotated it through different people's houses. Um, most of the time, it kind of was a space where women could come and say, this is what I've experienced within the last week. I have nobody to tell this to. I got to tell someone. And so it was a, a place where they could be safe and share that. Their frustrations uh, and crazy stories of things that they, you know, went through with Rexburg and within Mormonism. Um, and also it was, it was kind of a cool, a cool group and experiment, be, not experiment, a place because there was a variety of uh, spiritual, um, there was, um, so all, all post-Mormon so some that were, there were, you know, a couple of people who were progressive Mormons, a couple of people that were, it was mostly all out. Um, someone's a mystic, someone, you know, a handful of atheists, um, some that were just mainstream Christian, had, you know, transitioned in, into that. So it was nice that uh, I was actually experiencing a real environment where it really was totally accepting and an actual safe, real space. So that was nice um, to have. And it was nice because um, it was lonely being in Rexburg since it was the town that I grew up in. And it's a small town. My dad worked at the university. So you know everybody and everybody knew me. Mostly it's gotten bigger now. That's not the same. How many high schools in Rexburg? One. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so. Small it, town. Yeah. So it was Holly Parson coming back to Rexburg who not is just not not active she actually you know resigned completely so i was no longer a jack mormon who's inactive i was a dangerous wolf and word got around yeah yeah so there were people how did you get a sense that word had gotten around town that you had resigned because that's that's kind of a private thing you told your family but yeah. did you kind of try and keep that private or not i did and i told i told a couple of friends um but it, you know, it spreads like wildfire. Does it? Yeah, it does. It totally does. And what was that like to be in your hometown? It's where you grew up. You have warm feelings, all these mm -hmm. relationships. You've just made a private change around your faith, and it becomes a town gossip that sweeps through the town like wildfire. How does that make you feel, to live in that town in that circumstance? A, a stranger. And it, it, was, it was odd because— uh, a, you know, being a town family member and then being like a permanent overnight stranger. And we love you. It was, uh, it was a mixture still because there were some people that, a few that honestly didn't care. But most of those were people who moved into Rexburg who had the experience of uh, living with variety of people. Um, you know, with some exception of some people who grew up in Mormon uh, in Rexburg. Um, but then there were some people who were still kind and loving. And I understand this because I kind of experienced this when I was still Mormon with people who had left um, that still were kind and loving and treated me well. But there still was a pity that was there. And that was sad. And then it was. You know, it was surprising uh, what people like totally cut me off, you know, and I, and I knew that that was going to happen, that there, I, I, there would be people, friends and family that would, I'd be surprised the way that they would respond. Um, but it still was surprising who it would end up being. Um, yeah. So it just weird feeling of being back surreal, uh, being back in your home, but you're not welcome anymore and things are permanently changed. And the feeling that you, that I f was seen as dangerous, that was horrible. Cause I, you know, thought the reason I'm actually leaving this organization is cause, because of my ethics uh, and love and this isn't okay. And I'm uh, don't think parts of this are healthy and I don't want to support it and be associated with it anymore, but I'm fine with other people are. 
um, but then to be seen as dangerous or, you know, all the other stereotypes. Mm -hmm. That was difficult. It's super hard. Nobody to talked to. I think, yeah. I think Except part of family. why it might have is because Holly went through like the full old school process of resigning. This was before quitmormon.com. Yeah. This is, Different so time. she went through her bishop and had to meet with him multiple mm -hmm. times. And oh. it yeah, was it was like crappy. a whole, it was, yeah. How did he so. treat you? He, he was civil. Yeah. He was civil. Um, I think it was helpful to, since it's a small town, I knew, you know, he had some children who had left. So I think that that was just made it a little bit nicer. Mm -hmm. So he was a little more civil, I think, but okay. yeah, but it was, it was, it's, it was frustrating that I had to go through their, the organization's rules that I was divorcing, mm -hmm. <laughs> but still had to go by their rules for me to leave. But there was a part of me that's like, fine, I don't care because I, I want my name completely off this. I do not want them to have any ounce of authority over my head ever a again. So we're done. And that was very important for me to completely uh, sever ties. Right. I just, I relate a lot. It's not the same thing, but when, you know, Cash Valley is a small town where people talk lots of Mormons, especially North Logan and North, North Cash County. And when Margie and I were excommunicated, when I was excommunicated and our family left the church, we had known people for over 10 years. And mm -hmm. it's just the, the psychological energy of like having this wonderful community and then have it, having it become like a spiritual social ghost town and being viewed as dangerous. There's a psychological tax, a psychological energy that comes with that. That just, it's always with you. Whenever you're going anywhere, you drive by houses, you see people at the grocery store. There's just a never-ending psychological process in your mind. I'm dangerous. What are they thinking about me? What gossip are, are they saying? You know, oh my gosh, that's sad. We used to be so close. Now we're not friends anymore. Uh, am I even safe here? How is this affecting our kids? How, how could it affect her? You know, it's just like this constant... And Margie and I felt this, and we did. We stayed for two years after the excommunication, but it really wore us down after a while. And I'm just imagining what that was like for you, having grown up in the town. Yes, yeah, it, yeah, it was heavy. It wore me out. It was a constant struggle. Yeah, yeah, constant struggle. Some days it's just, it was, and there's some days that I thought I need to be able to give myself draw a boundary. I'm going to wear shorts <laughs> and a tank top outside Ooh. today. And then there was other days that's so like, I don't have the emotional energy to deal with looks all day long for me to go buy some lettuce at the store. So I'm just going to wear my regular <laughs> regular clothes. <laughs> clothes. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, the constant worry about my kids and they faced it. Will they be able to have friends and will they be rejected? And, and they were, and yeah. they had friends and they were rejected and, yeah, it had some bad, yeah, it was kind of like 50-50. 50% of people were great, 50% weren't anyways. Yeah. yeah. So, Ryan, I'm wondering now, let's switch to you a little bit. Like, your, your faculty at a church school and, uh, you know, you, you're supportive of, of Holly's decision to leave the church, but at the same time, you know, words getting around. So talk about why that, you know, in, in the normal outside of Utah world and probably even in more predominantly religious towns, a university job has, is going to have nothing to do with the religious choices of a, a spouse, a faculty, <laughs> right? right? It would just never, I don't care. Even if you're at Notre Dame, that nobody's going to care in the Notre Dame administration that a music faculty spouse isn't going to the Catholic church. Just it's a non-issue. Yeah. Now maybe in a Jewish yeshiva of a rabbi's wife leaves the church. I'm just, I'm sure there's somewhere Jehovah's witness Scientology somewhere where it's a big deal, but like very, very few places in the United States would it even be relevant in a, in a university faculty position? Yeah. So how is that different for BYU Idaho? It, uh, it's hugely <laughs> different. How? Um, so I, like, wait, I can't so right now. First, I'm just not even, yeah. I can't even guess. So the first, actually one of the first things I did after we got back is I set up a meeting with Kim Clark, who's the president, who was at the time the president of BYU Idaho. 
former Harvard guy, like yeah. big name, right? Yeah. And, uh, and I went and met with him and I still have really positive memories of that. Now, why did you want to meet with him? Because I was afraid that I would lose my job. So you're there because and Hollywood you're just resigned. having this fear. Yes. Where did that, was someone giving you signals? Was there, was there some sort of messaging? Like, I mean, why would you even have the fear? The, because the messaging all growing up about people who okay. leave is just huge. And if my primary responsibility at BYU-Idaho is to engender faith in the students, um, I needed to know if that was going to affect my employability there. So I, I set up a meeting with Kim Clark and I went and met with him. I just have to say that's interesting in and of itself. The fact that you felt like you needed to talk to the president of the university out of fear of your standing at a university, just because your spouse wasn't in the church. That's really just that alone is kind of blowing my mind. See, and I don't, that's funny to me because I, to me, it was like just obvious, like, Oh, I better do this. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh. So weird. So weird. So, um, 